and we are live. It's six o'clock Pacific time here in California. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I've done a live stream. I've been really, really busy working, you know, 50 to 60 hours a week, 55, 60 hours a week. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, I've uh, just been super, super busy. And a lot of live streams that other people do uh, are people hanging out, drinking, just having a jolly good time, which is fine. Um, I don't have any problem with that. I like to watch live streams like that when they're live. However, they're not much for uh, watching on the replay. I try to uh, do my live stream such that it has a value to not only people who are here live, but people who are catching it on uh, the replay. So that sort of determines the content of the live streams. And if I don't have something specifically that I want to get into <coughs> for a live stream, excuse me, then I kind of don't feel the unction to do so. Um, here in California, it is warm today. It's in the mid 70s, which isn't that uh, warm, except that in comparison, if you've become accustomed to the winter time and now it's in mid 70s, the mid 70s feels like the mid 80s, you know. But things are blooming, uh, mustard flowers out in the vineyards, uh, the cherry blossoms are blooming. Uh, really, really pretty, absolutely spectacular, lovely days. A great time to be living out in the wine country. Really, really enjoying it. I'm wearing short pants. I'm wearing shorts. I'm wearing shorts. I didn't have to turn on the heater to warm up the house last night. Uh, so it's just really, really nice enjoying the weather. It's days like this when you want to go for a drive and get out into the wine country here, uh, which is one of the things I love about uh, living here. So uh, a lot of the other whiskey tubers are doing lives on Friday nights. Uh, Saturdays, I think, work better for me. So I'm probably going to, when I do live streams, be shifting them towards uh, Saturdays just because uh, with work and so forth, uh, it works out better for me. I've been working weekends uh, just to get caught up on stuff, um, paperwork that doesn't get done during the middle of the week. I can go in the office. Nobody bothers me. No phone calls, no emails. I'm left alone. Now I can get some work done. All right, now I'm going to pour something real quick uh, and we'll get into our topic for tonight. I'm going to pour myself a little bit of the Balcona's Mirador uh, Texas uh, Single Malt Whiskey. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about climate and whiskey and sort of doing, uh, I don't have any notes or anything, slides that we put up like I usually do. Just talking off the top of my head, my head, my heads, top of my head, uh, and talk a little bit of a comparison between uh, the way you sort of understand wines and the impact of climate and whiskey in the impact of uh, climate. Uh, one other thing, um, I've been sort of debating whether I want to get into this or not. Um, my channel, uh, I don't get into sports, I don't get into politics, I don't get into anything other than whiskey, unless it's directly related to uh, whiskey. So I, I, I just try to stick to what it is uh, this channel is about, which is uh, understanding growing in the knowledge of whiskey and the whiskey journey and uh, learning about whiskey and having some fun with it as well. So it's academic plus learning stuff. I started another channel. You probably may have already heard about it. Uh, I, I grew up watching Star Trek. I'm a big Star Trek fan, and it's called uh, Whiskey Trek. And uh, I posted a video uh, earlier today. Uh, you might want to check it out. Um, even if you're not a Star Trek fan, uh, it, I go a really good overview of understanding why whiskey is as diverse as it is. So the topic is Idic, Infinite, which is a, a, a Vulcan motto, a Vulcan philosophy, uh, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. So I talk about the diversity in Star Trek and diversity in whiskey. Most of the time I am talking about whiskey in this video. So uh, if you want to check out the channel, and even if you're not into Star Trek, I cover a lot of stuff in there that I've never seen anybody else cover get in terms of giving a big overview understanding of how whiskey is made and how uh, the various factors in the production of whiskey contribute to its uh, diversity and complexity. And I put a link to the channel uh, in the chat. Anyway, that's Mr. Spock there in outer space with a bunch of whiskey bottles behind him. I, I'm looking forward to that, doing more stuff on that channel because <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, Star Trek, yeah, it's sci-fi and phasers and aliens and spaceships and all that, right? 
which is what I enjoyed when I was, <coughs> excuse me, just have allergies. I uh, enjoyed as a, as a kid. Take a wee sip. Hmm. But the show is more geared towards adults. It's you have almost naked green aliens dancing around. <laughs> you had Ahura with these very, very short, 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 short skirts. And a lot of adult themes to it. Uh, but it was also a platform for dis uh, discussing politics, religion, uh, philosophical ideas, uh, speculative scientific ideas uh, in physics and so forth. So I'm reading a stack of books on f related to philosophy of Star Trek and the physics of Star Trek and all that. So I'm looking forward to that doing more stuff on that channel because what I don't do on this channel, I can do on that channel as long as I tie it in to Star Trek and whiskey. And because Star Trek uh, has been a platform for dealing with all kinds of topics, I can do that on that channel. All right, enough about uh, the Star Trek uh, channel. But if you are a uh, Star Trek fan, you might want to check that out. Um, I do want to talk briefly, and I don't, I don't, because I, it, it's, I'm stressing out a little bit about it. Um, we probably all are if you pay attention to the news. And I don't want to talk about too much other than just sort of mention it in passing as it relates to whiskey. Um, if you watched my series on the history of Scotch whiskey, um, in which you go over 100 years uh, in the uh, develop, uh, uh, development history of whiskey and the various things that affected the whiskey industry. If I were to sum it up, uh, there are natural causes that affect uh, the whiskey business, such as the shortage uh, due to weather, climate, uh, shortage of grains. Um, some of that can be because we have better transportation. That, some of that can be sort of counterbalanced by uh, getting grains from somewhere else. Um, war, obviously, uh, because increase of taxes, taxes to pay for wars, as well as uh, grains and so forth being needed to su uh, supply the, the war effort. Um, but also it, it affects the economy. And then obviously prohibition. Prohibition is a huge impact on the whiskey industry. On the other hand, there have also been natural causes that helped the whiskey industry, but hurt the wine industry, namely phylloxera in the late 1800s, which was killing off grapevines, uh, vineyards throughout Europe. Uh, which means you didn't have brandy, which means if you're going to drink brandy, you're going to be drinking some other spirit, which means they go on to drink Irish whiskey and Scottish whiskey. So having an understanding of the history of whiskey in general or Scotch whiskey uh, can sort of help you see what is going on now and possibly what can happen in the near future regarding whiskey. Now, I'm not a prognosticator, right? I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, I am praying for peace. But if you if you haven't heard, uh, basically Russia has troops um, on the border of the Ukraine. Ukraine, if it joins NATO, NATO has uh, an alliance where if one of the members is attacked, uh, it, they, the others will join in to defend it. This was created post Second World War uh, to keep uh, the Soviet Union from expanding uh, further into Europe. Um, you, um, President Biden has made a verbal response. Consequently, things are really, really, really tense. Um, if I were to predict, I would say if when they, they would invade, they would invade as soon as the Olympics are over. That's my forecast. Consequently, um, the United States would get drawn into a war along with NATO. Consequently, we would be at war with Russia. Consequently, uh, I believe China and uh, other governments on that side of the fence would join in with, with Russia, and the consequence would be, among other things, uh, it would uh, affect us economically, it would affect um, commerce, it would affect transporting commercial goods, and it would affect whiskey. It would affect whiskey, just as every other major war we've ever had has had an impact on whiskey. So, uh, let's um, no. Christopher Malloy, that is correct. They are not a member of NATO. But should they decide to join, that would be the issue that would tip Russia over in, uh, into keep trying to keep them from uh, joining uh, NATO or a response to it. Um, 
the leader of Ukraine has already said they shouldn't, the United States shouldn't wait, but they should already go ahead and uh, move in. But anyway, I'm not going to get any more onto this. I'm just letting you know. Um, we could see things happen really, really quick and, and, and stuff go south really, really quick. And it would have, among other things, a huge impact on whiskey. Again, I'm not a prognosticator, um, but um, I'm hoping for the best. And not and what it would have, the impact it would have on whiskey would be the least of my concerns, um, but uh, it, it would definitely affect the whiskey industry. All right, uh, let's talk about um, uh, climate, climate. So uh, we're talking about climate, we're talking about weather. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Tomorrow's the Super Bowl here in the United States. Um, I'm 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 not sure who's in the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, I think the Bengals. I think the Bengals might be in it. Well, I only know that because I heard from other people. I don't follow professional sports. Don't really care if you're into football. Knock yourself out. Have a good time. Chad and Sarah over at uh, it's Bourbon Night. They're doing some Super Bowl thing. Have a good time. Knock yourself out. Um, I'm I'm not uh, really really uh, into it. Um, no, why did I bring up the stupid Super Bowl? I forgot. Uh, it's the L.A. Rams versus Cincinnati Bengals. Well, thank you very much. IC eighty six. Thanks. Um, I, what did I miss in the Super Bowl? Oh, no, I remember. Okay, I don't follow sports. So there are people who follow sports, and they say, you know, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, whatever, and builds up either to the World Series or to the Super Bowl or whatever else. I have, I don't follow. I have the foggiest ideas what the heck's going on with all that. I follow the weather. I pay attention to weather uh, um, patterns. I see 86 says, I'm not more worried about the Red China invading Taiwan. Um, Richie Z says, Bengals versus the Lambs. Okay. Uh, whiskey Straight Out says, if only more leaders would enjoy whiskey and get together and uh, <laughs> thrash out over a few drams, we'd be in a much better place. Probably. Probably. Just get together, drink a few. Although uh, Putin's probably more into drinking vodka uh, than into drinking whiskey. Although... The Russians are really big on champagne. They are real big champagne uh, consumers. Anyway, so I follow the weather patterns. Uh, I follow the weather because weather, uh, and you, it's up and downs, and there are key points in the year uh, that are really, really important. One of them is uh, in the spring because in the spring you have bud break. And I'm keeping holding down a burp. Um, the weather impact uh, of the weather patterns uh, leading up into harvest is going to tell you how good the vintage is, which is going to tell you how good the wines are. And then if you track, so, so it's pretty predictable if you track the weather throughout the year as to how good the uh, wines are going to be. The places that are most impacted by climate uh, and weather variations uh, tend to be, I would say, Bordeaux and Burgundy. Because of the classification system, they're not allowed to interfere with Mother Nature um, uh, or Providence and, and the impact it has. They're not allowed to, say, put up nets to protect the vineyards from hail, which is down in Chile. They can do that. So Chile has a you know, major problem with uh, um, hail storms, but they can put up these nets and help protect the vines. Whereas in uh, Bordeaux and uh, Burgundy, they cannot because the wines would then be getting declassified, which would reduce the, the value of it, all because of the sense of terroir. Terroir is a reflection of uh, the soils and the aspect and uh, the weather variations in the year and so on and so forth. So because of the uh, idea of terroir and wanting to express terroir in uh, the wines, they, for the part, um, don't spend a lot of time protecting their vineyards. 2013, for example, both in Bordeaux and Burgundy, catastrophe, just a huge catastrophe in terms of weather. And it gets more, the, the two most critical years, uh, times of the year tend to be uh, at bud break, because if you get a frost at bud break, you know, you get a warm weather, right? Spring's coming on, you know, bud breaks, they just start to, to, to uh, bloom. And if you got a late frost, 
it kills the bud break, and boom, there goes your vintage. We do have the potential for that here in California. I would say frost is a bigger danger than anything else, and fires, of course, uh, in the summertime and in the fall. But they have come up with a number of different ways to mitigate that uh, here in California. If you go through vineyards, frost tends to uh, settle where there's a valley and there's a, a low spot where you're not going to get a lot of a breeze to blow it out. So you can drive through the Napa Valley and Sonoma and you can see these gigantic fans out in the middle of the vineyards. And the purpose of those is to just move the air to keep the moisture from settling on, you know, the dew from settling on the vines and, uh, and frost and from uh, causing bud break. They now use satellites and they have sensors to where an alarm will go off if there's a danger of frost. So it's not just someone staying up all night and keeping an eye on it. You know, there's a lot of high tech means of monitoring the weather and they can mitigate it with giant fans. They have some, some places they'll actually use a helicopter and fly over the vineyards to move the air. In the old days, they, in fact, some places still do this. They have these smudge pots. Basically, you just, by burning these little fires uh, in these little containers uh, in the vineyard to raise the temperature. So um, I don't follow sports. I do follow weather patterns because it's going to tell me what the vintage is going to be like. Because uh, climate or weather has an impact on the vintage. Now, there are similarities. And I've had to recalibrate my brain um, over the over the last five six years. I've been doing this uh, this channel uh, for almost six years, including from the time <coughs> when I, I started whiskey on my other channel and then moved it over to this one. Um, there's a sense in which you sort of calibrate your brain to understand when smelling and tasting a wine or whiskey, um, a sense of what the climate did on the wine or the spirit and understanding the cause and effects as to why it is the way it is what gives you those characteristics those aromas and those flavors and which is then when doing a blind tasting uh, gives you a sense of where it came from with wines more of a sense of vintage as well um, and gives you an understanding of the choices that were made by the winemaker or the whiskey producer as to what they're going to do to mitigate um, the cons of the conditions that they have. Now, I, you heard me say this before. Everything in life has its pros and cons, its strengths and weaknesses. And where there are weaknesses or where there are cons, what you have to do is seek a way to come up with a corrective action plan, a way to mitigate that, to counterbalance that. Um, and that's really comes along with understanding your place you if you're in scotland you know if you grew up in scotland you're going to grow up with an understanding of the place you're in and the weather and the impact it has it comes over time um if you're a vintner a winemaker you need to get to understand the place in which you're in so that it's you understand the behavior of your vines uh, if you're new to winemaking you're new to region you just bought some plot of land you plant some grapes it's going to take you generations to sort of figure out um, what the cause and effects are and how things are going to result and the decisions you need to make in doing things in your vine vineyard and in wine uh, production. Um, but say in France and in Burgundy, a lot of the stuff was figured out hundreds of years ago by monks. They have a long history. California is still figuring itself out. Um, if you, if you look at the history of California and even St. Oregon, they, there are times in which they didn't plant the right types of grapes, the right clone of grapes, the right varieties of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet in the right places. And consequently, they had to pull it out and plant some other um, clone of Chardonnay because they still had to figure out the soils. They still had to figure some things out. In time, you know your vineyards. In time, you know your place. And so you can, with some predictability, make certain choices. Uh, one of the wineries that I worked at, um, they use natural yeast. Uh, they didn't add yeast to their fermentation. They use native yeast. And I, I was uh, an intern um, studying there. And so I asked them, well, did you ever get a stuck fermentation? Well, this is a like a third generation farm of vines. And they knew the vineyards, they knew the soils very well. 
And he, I think he said like maybe out of 50 years of they've had one stuck fermentation. So because they know what's out in the field, because they know um, the yeast that is out there, they have with some predictability the ability to know what the outcome is going to be. So uh, whiskey industries, young whiskey industries such as Texas are, uh, although I think they're doing a great job, I think they're figuring a lot of things out. Um, uh, they're probably still making adjustments. They're probably still learning. Uh, the, the Texas whiskey industry, um, maybe 10 years or younger, you know, they're, they, they just, they're, just, they're still coming into their own. But because of the ability to share information, internet, and so forth, uh, they're learning very, 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 very quickly. And there's a lot of experimentation going on uh, as well. Alrighty, uh, I should say hello to everybody who's in the chat. I know I just sort of kicked off jumping into a bunch of topics. So let me say hello as people are uh, streaming in. Uh, Judith Stoll, thank you so much for tuning in. IC86, Uncle Nate drinks whiskey. Thanks for <laughs> tuning in. Richie Z, how you doing, neighbor? If you ever come up here to Sonoma, let me know. Uh, whiskey Straight Out from Ireland, thank you so much for tuning in. Beth Higgins, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Crystal from Moy, of course, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, taste and sensibility. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Hanging AZ. How you doing? Thanks for tuning in. Um, Richard Amira. Hey, how you doing, Richard? Um, <laughs> thanks for uh, tuning in. Alrighty. So, um, understanding climate and understanding its impact, whether it's on a whiskey or a grape, requires you to be more global in your thinking about whiskey. Uh, if all you like is bourbon, you want to focus on bourbon and just do bourbon, that's fine. Uh, if you just want to focus on Irish whiskey, you just want to focus on Scotch, that's fine. But if you really want to understand climate and its impact on whiskey, I think you need to think a little more globally because it's only by uh, contrast and comparison of uh, basically more or less the same sort of grains or grapes being grown in different places, being, uh, uh, you know, mash fermented, distilled, and aged in different places, you're not really going to understand your own place. You, not, you can only understand Scotland truly by comparing single malts, particularly with single malts from other countries. Because all you're going to know have is a sort of myopic perspective and understanding the impact of climate, weather, and casks um, on malt. But by constantly tasting and trying malt whiskeys, particularly malt, from the United States, from India, if you can, from Australia, from Japan... Uh, obviously, just a little bit closer to Ireland. Ireland actually has a slightly warmer climate than uh, Scotland. So a younger Irish whiskey isn't quite as youthful as uh, a Scottish uh, whiskey. Uh, young, uh, uh, a three-year Irish doesn't come across the same as a three-year-old Scotch. Just saying that. All right. You then sort of have to... Pay attention to the cause and effects between the climate and the weather and what it does to the palate, what it does to the aromas and flavors, and then sort of put that in your head and calibrate that, right? You kind of go, you, you get a, a, a sense of it, and that's only by repetition. So in studying wine, for example, uh, to understand Pinot Noir, for, let's just take one grape, um, there's a difference between Pinot Noir from California Oregon, um, obviously Burgundy, uh, and say New Zealand. Um, and it's only by constantly tasting them and smelling them that you get a, get a sense of place because of the climate impact it has on the grapes. And gosh, there's always, there's ways of mitigating the impact. There's ways of sort of navigating all that. I'm going to take another sip. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now of course wine's a little more challenging because um, 
there can be vintage variation. You can have, say in Bordeaux, warmer years and cooler years. So understanding the weather impact on the grapes as reflected in the wine isn't just a regional thing, it's an individual year thing. Uh, the difference though in whiskey is you're looking at a greater time span in terms of uh, the aging process. I, in terms of the, uh, like the grain, you know, I think you're gonna go, oh, this is a particularly good vintage of this barley. I know um, Waterford is doing all kinds of experiments and, and getting, you know, uh, variances in the barley from different fields and all that. I, I got that, but they're um, in the minority. Most of the time, most producers are buying or growing grain for a quantity of alcohol, highest yield of starch, uh, lower amount of nitrogen, rather than particular flavor components that they're gonna get out of the barley. That's the, the majority of it. But um, in smelling and tasting whiskeys and understanding the weather and the climate, a person could have a misconception that a warmer, hotter climate, such as Texas, Tasmania, um, South Africa, um, uh, India, that you can age a whiskey faster. So, um, by the way, I already recorded my review of the lineage. The lineage, it'll post on Tuesday. And I had to sort of correct myself in the producing of the whiskey uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the video uh, of reviewing the whiskey because I actually accidentally said about aging faster and then I corrected myself. It's not that it ages faster, but in some sense, it matures faster. But not equally and it not evenly and not you're not getting all the components of the range of the characteristics that you get in time from extracting from the, from the cask. What do I mean by that? Imagine, so if you look at a child, when a child grows up, um, there's certain, you know, the ratio of the size of the head to the arms and shoulders and legs for a little baby, the proportions for the baby don't stay the same as they get older, right? The trunk of the body gets longer, legs will get longer. You, you know, babies have these gigantic heads. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's right. When they're real little, real little, they can't even keep their held their own head up. You know, <laughs> you know their head wobbles like this. <laughs> um, well, uh, <laughs> as we get older and we get longer arms, longer legs, longer torso, and our, our we don't have gigantic heads. You know, like this, or some of us do maybe don't have these gigantic heads in proportion to um, the rest of our body as babies do. Well, imagine. If a baby grew up to be or matured quickly so that it was five feet tall, six feet tall, and kept the same proportions, it would look really, really, really strange. You'd be like, wow, see, and imagine if you could, boom, grow up really, really quickly, you know, like that. And you go, wow, the baby grew really, really fast. It aged quickly because look how tall the baby is. No longer baby. Yeah, but you go, okay, well, it got the height, and maybe it got the brain development so it can talk, and it can function as an adult does, but look at the proportions. It still, it still has, you know, chubby baby body. It's just bigger, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, that's sort of an analogy of the of maturation of whiskeys in a warmer climate. Uh, in some ways, they seem like they age faster. But on the other hand, the proportions of what is there isn't the same as if it had matured in a cooler climate, such as Scotland or Ireland, right? So you don't get everything. It, it doesn't equal out. So there are pros and cons. Uh, to On the one hand, from a business side, a whiskey, three, four years, five years in a warm climate, such as uh, Texas, um, can be ready to be sold, and you're not going to have the youthful notes, or if you do it right, uh, you won't have those like those green notes that you would get out of a, you know, three, four, five year old 
Scotch or Irish. You're not going to get the powdered sugar saccharin notes that you get out of those. They're sort of some of those youthful notes aren't going to be there. On the other hand, um, it's not going to have the some of the maturistic characteristics, the mature characteristic characteristics of a Scotch whiskey or an Irish whiskey that has slowly and evenly matured over 10, 12, 15 plus years. So there's a trade-off. There, there is a trade-off. On the one hand, from a business side, boom, you can put out, I think, quality whiskeys in a shorter period of time to have a higher turnover rate. On the other hand, there's a certain character to the whiskeys that aren't going to be there the way they are in a scotch. So on the one hand, the Scots might be going, gee, I wish business-wise we could mature things faster so that we could and keep up with the market and selling whiskey. On the other hand, there are people in, say, Texas or India or, or somewhere that go, gee, I wish we could slow things down a bit so that they had more of the maturation characteristics of Scotland. So there's these pros and cons to both sides. This is similar to the difference between, say, the Napa Valley and Bordeaux in growing Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, uh, in Bordeaux, you know, I'm, I'm always going to talk about wine, but this is how my brain works. In Bordeaux, you have a maritime climate, a cooler climate, but you have really good soil. Uh, and actually, the soil there is due to the Dutch. The Dutch, that place was a swamp. <laughs> the, the left bank or the west bank of Bordeaux was a swamp. And the Dutch came in because they're very accustomed to dealing with water, right? Uh, and building dams and windmills and all that. Um, they came in into Bordeaux and basically drained the swamp. <laughs> and then the French uh, went in and uh, started planting vineyards. So they have these really good gravelly, rocky soils, uh, which are really, really good for Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux. But they have a maritime climate and they have more... Uh, Sort of wacky weather. The vintages are a lot more up and down. Flip side, Napa Valley, maritime climate, so it's a little bit warmer. Uh, you have less of a problem getting ripeness. Um, however, you have a little bit more challenge maintaining acidity, and you have different soils. They aren't quite as favorable as the Bordeaux so soils. You get some alluvial soils, uh, and you get uh, some volcanic soils and stuff like that. Still high quality wines, but People in Napa Valley go, oh, I wish we could do things like Bordeaux. And people in Bordeaux go, I wish we could do things like they do in the Napa Valley. And there's a sort of parallel between that, I think, in the way some things are between, say, Texas and Scotland. Because they both have the pros and cons and things they have to mitigate and deal with to make adjustments and to try to produce the best whiskey or wines uh, that they can. Uh, one of the things they do in wine in mitigating the, the weather issues, taking a sip. <laughs> Copper Bone says, Wobblehead could be a great Irish whiskey name. <laughs> could be. Uh, he says, Greetings from uh, Missouri. And Rick Hayes, uh, hello from Texas. I don't see the chat move along. I know I'm doing most of the talking. I'm not interacting that much. Sorry. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in there. Just put my name in there. Put, put an asterisk. Start to spell my name, and it should populate, and then I'll see the orange, and then I can answer the questions. So um, so one of the things they do in terms of mitigating um, whether for, – for wine, it has to be done on the vineyard. Uh, in the Central Valley, because it's warmer in the Central Valley, they – tend to use a lot more sort of bushy vines because they're going to, because it's warmer and more sun contact, they're going to use more of a heavy uh, canopy over the grapes uh, to mitigate the impact of the sun. You go close to the coast, they want more sunlight because they want more uh, ripeness because you got the coolness of the ocean right there. So they do something called VSP, vertical shoot positioning, in which the vines are basically trust to be straight up so you get more uh, interaction uh, with the sun. And sometimes, depending how the year is going, uh, they may, at a crucial point, when they're getting close to harvest and they're not getting the ripeness that they want, they actually might go in. It's a risky thing to do. You have to, you know, you got to call your shots as to what you want to do. Um, but if it looks like it's a cooler year and you're not getting the ripeness you want, you might go in there 
and have people start pulling leaves off the vines to get more sun contact. But obviously, you can't put the leaves back on. So if it should flip around the other direction, you're kind of in an oops. All right. Uh, <laughs> I don't see anybody commenting. So I'm kind of wondering if anybody's still watching. I know, I know I'm know, i in I'm in lecture mode. Somebody say something just so I know you're all still there and I'm not talking to myself. Thank you. Um, so what are you going to do? Uh, and this is a point where I would like, if, if uh, uh, the Licorice Brothers happen to be watching or anybody else in the Texas whiskey industry, uh, if you'd like to come on and, and give me specifics as what the, the specific what your distillery does. It's, man, I'm hold on. There we go. Okay, you're here. Cool. Thank you very much. I know I'm rattling off facts at 100 miles an hour. Um, so what are you going to do? Thanks. John Husser says, greetings from Illinois. Uh, love the content. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, call your doctor when, you're trust, when you trust your bushy vines. Uh, what do, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm great. I'm great. Okay. I get you. Everybody's watching. But it's not moving. I wonder if I somehow lost the connection. All right. We're good. So, uh, so how are you going to mitigate... Uh, or say sort of counterbalance um, the more extreme temperatures. In, in other words, in order to sort of slow down the intensity, you actually you want to more you want your whiskey to spend more time in cask rather than uh, less time in cask, so you can get the best maturation level interaction with the cask. That is more that's the issue in Texas, right? And there are a number of different ways in which they're doing it. And, and my knowledge of this obviously is not from personal experience. It's from listening to people in the Texas whiskey industry. And this is because, you know, comparing Texas with other places in the world is a, is a popular topic. Uh, this to issue comes up a lot. Several different things that they do and some and experimentation. One has to do with the size of the cast. So what is that your ratio of uh, wood to spirit? And so, by uh, adjusting how much impact your cast is going to have on the spirit, you're going to make a sh uh, call your shot as to how fast it's going to grow. Another thing they do is um, frequent removing from one cast to another uh, in order to dial in the impact. Okay, the, the spirit has spent, you know, a year in this cask. It's extracted a lot of the cask. Now, in order to sort of put the brakes on the cask impact, slow it down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Gotta slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. What you have to do is now take it out of the cask and put it into not necessarily a neutral cask, but definitely not a new cask. So something that's a little bit more neutral to sort of um, put the brakes on the cask impact. So now that's a lot more, a lot more labor, but you basically you start off one cask and move it to another cask. One cast that's going to get more uh, extraction of flavor it could be as little as six months. That spirit spends this much time in this cast uh, in six months, uh, and and then quickly after six months, boom, it's got its boom impact from that particular cask. Now we're going to move it into a larger cask uh, with that that's not going to have as much wood impact, so that it can now have uh, the more natural. Aging time, and this is why, if you look at the notes for the various um, uh, whiskeys, if they provide the, the notes on 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 the barrel impact, and that's what they're doing. So basically, what you're doing is you are rather than plucking leaves from vines to get more sun impact or less impact, or uh, or taking the vines and then trellising them up to get more impact, and then letting them down to get less impact. Right, because in wine, that's where the adjustments being made out in the vineyards. In whiskey, obviously, uh, you've already harvested the grapes. Um, I mean, the, the 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 grains, the barley. The adjustments got to be made in the aging process uh, um, with the casks, and so you have to do with the casks what vineyards do and what winemakers do out in the vineyards. And so it's about learning how, and given our climate in this particular place, whether you're talking about, say, Waco, Texas, you're talking about Austin, Texas, you're talking about um, Houston, Texas, or you're talking about Hyde, Texas, or Denison, Texas, is knowing where you are and your weather impact here, 
what has the weather been like for this year in our particular place, cold and hot, cold and hot, right? So this year, and I think last year as well, they had these crazy ass freezes uh, in, in Texas, uh, particularly uh, say in the Austin area. If you follow the tribe, they're posting pictures um, of, in fact, I think Richard might even post some pictures. Uh, I think Richard posted one. I think it was the the the, uh, the sword up on top of the tower at the uh, Wizard Academy, and there was ice on there and all that. Anyway, so in production, that's what they're doing. They're doing the mitigation and they're doing the juggling and the judgments they have to do um, with the cast versus doing it out in, in the vines. And in order to do that, it takes time to get to know. Um, and experimentation and tasting, all right? They, they got to taste, 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 smell and taste, taste, smell and taste to see things where they're at. It's not pure just out of theory or out of some sort of uh, mechanical measurements. You got you to taste them, see where they're at. And, and do an in-cask in uh, uh, adjustments. Now, there are probably more ways in which adjustments are being made. Um, some say in Kentucky, like Maker's Mark, they're actually making like wine caves so that the, the casts are underground, they're not getting, so they can mitigate some of the, the, the temperature issues by actually putting on underground. To, so once you go a certain depth into the ground, um, you end up with a much more constant temperature. Typical, say in California, uh, once you go a certain depth into the ground, say in the hillside or underground, you know that the temperatures go between 57 and 62 degrees Fahrenheit. This is why uh, it's besides um, to have a maintain and humidity. You maintain humidity, which reduces the amount of evaporation coming out of a cask. Uh, but you also save a ton of money because you're not spending money on temperature controls because you bet. So you, all your money spent up front and digging a hole into the ground and whether in the side of a mountain and then you know making this cave. Um, but in the long term, you save a lot of money on energy and time and stuff like that. Well, uh, you can do that with whiskeys as well. And there's been some experiments going on where they've actually buried casts into the ground just to see what it does. I think Treaty Oak had a little experiment uh, uh, like this uh, as well. Now, if most, most of your land is flat and you don't have a lot of hillsides to you know, bury, you know, dig a cave into, then some other kind of housing, warehouse and so, so forth that has a lot of insulation, but I think that gets expensive as well. And the, the, one of the challenging costs is going to be if you're going to try to maintain the temperature in an artificial cave is um, the energy costs. And this is why if you can go into the ground, then you don't have that issue. It'll be self-regulating and it'll be consistent. Uh, you're around. I'm taking that a step. So in a little bit, I'm going to talk about from the smelling and tasting side, how can what how can you tell what the climate is? In other words, if I was doing this blind, how would I know where it is, where it's from? But before we get to do that, uh, take a little drink of water. Oh, Richard Merritt says that was Dave Young. Oh, okay. Uh, nice guy. Just met Dave last time I was down there. So uh, most of this current um, series, I just finished doing a series on independent Isla whiskeys, now kicking off one on Texas. Most of the bottles are going to be from Balcones. So I do have this one here, um, Palo Duro, uh, Texas single malt. This is from Andalusia. So I'll be doing this one. I will probably wrap up the series with doing this bottle from Crowded Barrel. Uh, this uh, is Eleanor. It's a sourced spirit, but then A's in Texas. And this is done in an Isla cask. Isla cask. I think uh, Daniel said that they were hoping for a little more peat impact on this. I think the cask from the Freud, they didn't get quite the impact that they wanted. Uh, I tasted it when we were there. Uh, was it in the Bastards Bowl, I think? Uh, anyway, uh, so I tasted it there. I think it was just before the Bachelor's Ball uh, last year, and I liked it, so I picked up a bottle. The other Balcones I'll be doing, as I said before, uh, the first one will be the Lineage. This will, the, video, uh, the review will post on Tuesday. Then uh, the Mirador, which is what I've been drinking this evening. 
Um, this is sort of, in a sense, the <coughs> excuse me, the bigger brother of um, lineage. It has some traits in common in terms of fruit characteristics, uh, but it's higher in ABV and it has some other distinctiveness. But in terms of the spectrum of like fruit character, it has a lot more of that orange, uh, candied orange character. Uh, I'll be doing oh the froak. Uh, this is a beast. Um, <laughs> Uh, real high ABV cash drink. This one's at 61.9% alcohol by volume. Uh, a lot of people have already reviewed this. It's a fantastic uh, whiskey. Some people think this is one of the best of um, Balcones. I've already reviewed them, but I did it with the Brujeria I love and the Hechiceros. The Hechiceros is pork cast and the Brujeria is um, sherry cast. And those are absolutely fantastic. And then this is the Peated, a Balcones Peated. And I'll be reviewing this one as uh, well. All righty. So it'll be mostly Balcones. I also have some sample bottles that were sent to me. Um, I think Robert Licker sent to me. One, two, three, four. I have six sample bottles from Iron Root Republic. Uh, they had sent them to Mash and Drum and Scott's Test Dummies. Uh, a while back, because they were already doing videos on it, I wasn't going to just do the same video, same whiskeys that they were doing at the same time. And I wasn't in the middle of doing a Texas series, but now that I'm doing a Texas series, I might go through those uh, as well. Um, but I'll figure that out later. I might do that at the end and then perhaps see if I can get Robert to come on and we can talk about these uh, whiskeys. Um, John Husser says, I would like to try a Texas single malt. What would you recommend for a first bottle? It depends on where you live. First of all, uh, I would not buy the True Blue. If you try the True Blue and you go, oh, that's Texas whiskey or that's Balcones, I think you'd be sadly disappointed. Now, if you like, now if someone out there, out there likes the True Blue, Merry Christmas, go for it, go ahead. To me, it reminds me of candy corn. Um, not real big on it. Um, if you can, basically, if you can, in terms of the wider distributed bottles, just find one. Just find one that's a single malt. Just find a Balcones single malt. They do uh, rye. The rye is not like any other rye. Um, some people aren't real big fan of. It. Just find something that's a single malt and and, and go from there. And it usually it's going to be above sixty percent alcohol by volume. They'll take plenty of water and plenty of ice. If you can get something out of Texas, um. Out there in Texas, there's a lot more available. I would say the Hechiceros and the Bur area, in terms of my experience, are ones that I really, really like. Alrighty. Uh, I've already gotten into so I, I so when I bought this for peated whiskeys, I think peated whiskeys in general need more time to open up. So I actually opened this up over six months ago. And I opened it up and tried it over six months ago intentionally because I just had the sense that it's gonna need some time to breathe. And I wanted it to have some air before I got around to reviewing it. Um, just preliminary. I think this is better for using blending with other whiskeys than it is on its own. But uh, I'll, I'll do a more formal review later on. All right. So if there are other ways, it was Texas, rather heavy climate distilleries sort of mitigate certain characteristics of the whiskey. Uh, feel free to leave a comment down below if they're watching later on. There are other things you could do. You could do blending. You could use a, a younger whiskey with an older whiskey and sort of get a, uh, a middle road compare uh, of the aromas and flavors. You could do, do it through blending. Obviously, they do plenty of blending. Uh, if you notice, these whiskeys don't have age statements on it. Age statement is a big issue, obviously, in uh, Scotland and in Ireland. Putting an age statement on Texas whiskey is kind of silly because you're talking two, three, three years, four years. You, you know, you're not talking 12 years, 15 years. You, you know, uh, you, you, so the age isn't a, a, the big selling factor there. Um, so you could do it through blending. So a bottling of, let's say, Brujeria or whatever, and with sherry casks, you might use a, a number, a whole bunch of different casks, all in sherry casks with different characteristics at different levels of maturation and then be blending those in order to get the profile that you want right so this happens in wine as well uh bordeaux uh 
for example, that they use several different grapes, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cap Franc, um, Malbec, Carmenere, and I'm leaving one out. Um, Petite, Petite Verdot, if I, I may have let that out. And what they do is because of these grapes all mature and ripen at different rates, and because there's gonna be variances in the year, what grapes they use to go into the blend will depend on uh, the vintage, on the, the weather for that particular year. And so some years they're gonna use more Cabernet, some of these more, a little bit more or Cabernet Franc, or some years they're gonna use more Merlot, some years they, and some they're gonna go away, we need something to fill in the mid palate, so we're gonna use some uh, Petit Verdot. Well, you know, we can use some bigger, jammy or riper fruits, or we might bring in some more Malbec, and so on and so forth. In the same way, so Bordeaux is about the wines, isn't about this is a Cabernet or this is a Merlot, it's about the sense of place and the vintage. If the place is Bordeaux, and then the sub appellations within Bordeaux, such as Saint Estef, um, and then, um, or, or Pouillac, uh, and then the, the vintage. When in a similar fashion in, in blending, uh, you're gonna take uh, various casks of various whiskeys, it, but your goal is we're gonna do a sherry cask, uh, but you can take a number of different casks, a number of different maturation rates, um, a number of different sizes of casks, and then start to dial in the profile that you want. Just like you're using different grapes from Bordeaux, you could use a number of different casks, a number of different sizes, number di at different maturation rates to get the blend that you want. And so it really becomes um, the art of blending, the art of blending to get the profile that you want. And this is why it's important for uh, years of getting years of experience, have a really good nose, a really good palate, um, and de develop a consistent, consistent profile uh, in order to get the, the, the profile you want for the whiskey. And if you see some photos and so forth of the lab uh, at Balcones where they have, to have a ton of glasses laid out, and they're doing these blending teams of, and to get the profile they want. That's basically how you get it. Now, we, we do this in wines as well. Uh, one of the things I do for wineries, and just a few of them, um, is I'll be on the blending team. It'll be the, the winemaker and myself as a sommelier, and uh, a number of different, see, just a Pinot Noir uh, in various casts to get the profile we want for that particular Pinot Noir, even though it's all from the same vineyard, but different casts that we think are better than others to get the profile we want for the Pinot Noir. So even though it's all one grape, all from one vineyard, we are using different casks to get that profile, to achieve that profile that we want uh, for that uh, uh, wine. But you have to know and understand, this is what this wine tastes like now, but where wine differs from whiskey is a wine continues to mature in the bottle. So consequently, you need to understand, okay, this is what it tastes like now, but in six months, a year, two years, five years, this is where it's gonna go in the bottle. That's what's very, very different in, in whiskey uh, because what, more or less, once it goes in the bottle, that's it. The maturation more or less is over. Yeah, you can get a, a, a bottle aged characteristic off of whiskey scotch that are 50 years old, whatever. But more or less, you're talking about really uh, the aging has stopped once you put it in, into the bottle. Um, and so... Um, Understanding what it's going to be like is really if if we take this and this and this and we blend them together, um, and this is what it is like after blending them, um, and once they marry well, uh, then you know you've got what you've got, and this is what it's going to taste like after you put it in the bottle and after the consumer opens it a year from now, six months, a year from now. Um, and that's one of the key differences between uh, being a blender for spirits, whiskey versus wine is. There's been times in which there's been a call on a vintage. I'm thinking of like, say like the 98 from um, Napa Valley, in which it was called a lesser vintage. And so the value went down, the prices went down and so forth. But for those who bought the 98s, okay, we're going over 24 years ago, uh, who those who bought the 98s and held on to them, 10 years later, when they were opening them up, they were like, hey, you remember this off vintage, this not so great vintage? These are showing really good now. And that's little, that's what makes it dinner with wine a little more challenging because you really need to understand and know how well that wine is going to continue to progress in the bottle. And if you're smart or whatever, and to, to understanding wines is 
you have a whole bunch of the same vintage and to understand how they progress in time is you keep going back and keep opening bottles year after year after year after year so that you understand how that wine typically develops over in time because you've tasted that same vintage but opened up over the years i have done that so even though i don't do wine reviews and whatever i still could keep my fingers on the pulse of the wine industry there's 10 chateau in bordeaux that i keep track of uh, and there's a few wineries here in california i keep track of and so i have of certain wineries i have certain wines where i bought a case and then every year i open one up uh, opened up uh, on release and then oh wait a few years open one up wait a few years open them up um and just see how uh, the wine progresses and it's a lot of fun even if i'm not using that for business purposes it's a lot of fun to do that all righty so what about smelling and tasting uh smelling and tasting um if i'm given i need to pour myself something a little bit more um i'm gonna put this is the froke i'm gonna pour myself a little bit of froke but this froke will make you choke because it's such high abv I'm then going to need to add a little bit of water to it. Um, and I don't have a straw or anything like that, so I'm going to carefully do it by hand. Um, this is where it sort, of, there sort of has to be the sort of calibrating of your brain to where you recognize certain characteristics and what those characteristics are typical of. It's a tiny little bit, tiny little bit. Hold on. There we go. I'm, I'm not major concerned about drowning this thing. Um, and really, if you could, if you could get the same spirit from the same distillery and age it two different places, that would be an unbelievable value in education. Now, some of this is going on. I believe Balconis has shipped casks to different places. Uh, for experiment, experimental reasons. <coughs> um, so what is this going to age like over in Scotland versus here? I've got a bottle of uh, the spirit. is from Aaron Distillery on the Isle of Aaron from La Cranza. Uh, I got this at um, the crowd. Yeah, this place, the Crowded Barrel. Uh, they call it Errant. And so it was aged in Austin, Texas, but the spirit came from the distillery. Um, that... It, Besides it being a really, really, really good whiskey, it is, I, from my perspective, it's more valuable as an education in understanding climate impact. Because you take that whiskey, if you smell and taste it, you can, and, and, you're, and if you're familiar with the Aaron, say the Aaron 10 year old, you can see the correlation between the Aaron 10 year old and that whiskey, and yet, uh, this is a whiskey, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show you the bottle. Um, I think I showed this in the last live stream. It's called Errant. So basically, this is from, the spirit is from Aaron. Look at the color on that. And yet it's aged in Austin, Texas. The value of this is, uh, and then get a, a bottle of the Aaron 10-year-old, is the side-by-side, -side, and the difference between those two Um it's gonna primarily be the climate. And that's what's really gonna go, you're gonna get the light bulb come on your head and you're gonna go, oh, now I get it, now I get it. I, I wish more of this sort of thing was taking place. I wish more was available. Um, I wish there could be co cooperations between distilleries from both sides of the pond um, so, so that um, people could experience the differences. I, but I think it, it, I mean, it's such a, a nerd geek commodity that there probably wouldn't be a huge market for it, but it would be absolutely awesome. Just so you, you understand what the sense of place does uh, to a whiskey. So what I do is for a whiskey in Scotland that has age on it, there are things that go away and things they get added to the profile of the whiskey. What begins to go away is that new makey character. So that means the first thing you do, you need to smell and taste some new make to register that in your head. Um, but the green notes, and I mentioned before that sort of um, powdered sugar saccharine notes, 
as the whiskey ages, those characteristics start to go diminish and diminish and diminish, diminish. And more of the cask influence increases, increases, and increases. Now, you can cover up those new making characteristics somewhat with peat, peat and barley. And there's some people who like that. And if you like that, you like that. I, I, I don't have a judgment on anyone who likes it. If you like it, you like it. I personally am not real. It doesn't offend me. I just, I'm not real big on it. Um, that starts to go away. Now, that's not the only characteristic. That's some, one of the most obvious characteristic of a, a young, say, young scotch versus an older scotch. And I've been trying, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think about this even when I'm not smelling or tasting whiskey, when I'm washing dishes, when I'm reading a book, when I'm at work, when I'm driving down the road, how can I can convey this concept to someone to explain this? And this is, <laughs> this is it. This is my analogy. And it, every analogy breaks down at some point, so it won't be perfect. Um, <laughs> Uh, Richard Mary says, we had Emma Khan yesterday blending with, oh, Daniel. Oh, cool. Emma Crandall, a uh, new Bacchanas blender uh, visit as well. Oh, nice. Uh, less non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> okay. So imagine this. Th this is just an analogy. Texas, with, excuse me, Scotland, the spirit's impact on the whiskey is like someone taking your shirt and tugging on it like this. In warmer weather, spring, well, summer, it goes like this. In the winter, it goes like this. Summer, well, spring and winter, excuse me, spring and summer, it goes like this. It's pulling on your shirt. Imagine it pulling on your shirt. And then the winter, it goes taut again. So it's this. A little bit of tug. Boom, tug. Over the years, you're doing this with the cask. The spirit is pulling on the cask, right? Titty twisters. No. Okay. So, so this is this is what this is what this is what um, the change in the temperature in the dunge warehouse or whatever kind of warehouse they have, it's giving these little tugs on the cask as spirit moves in and out of the cask or in and out of the shirt. In a more intense climate, a more ex extreme, not just in how hot it gets, but the radical fluctuation in the climate, climate, Texas is doing this. I don't want to rip my shirt. It's, I mean, it's pulling. It's like pulling on it and then poof, back tight again. Poof, poof. And not just over a year, but throughout the year. It's poof, poof, poof. And I'm just, I don't know, screw up my shirt. I'm gonna, I'll put my shirt out of shape. But that's what it's doing. And it's doing it multiple times in the year because of the ups and downs. Uh, I remember it was one bachelor's ball. The first one I went to uh, a few years ago, I arrived, what plane landed, it was like, I think 45 degrees of Fahrenheit when we landed. And the next day it was up by like 15, 20 degrees or something. And then it can go down again. So the crazy thing about Texas is, so California the weather app is real. So what's it, what's the weather going to be like over the next three days? It's really accurate. It's accurate almost to a whole week. You know, it's fairly consistent, right? The weather. So the weatherman, it's like it's going to be it's going to be sunny and clear and warm. You know, the the, the weatherman in California doesn't have to do work real hard. In contrast to Texas, where it radically shifts and changes and is a lot more uh, unpredictable. And the result is it does some crazy ass things with the spirit. Well, in smelling and tasting wines, let's just take Pinot Noir. P besides the soils, because because Pinot Noir is very reflective of soils where it's at. Uh, there's a guy named by the name of Raj Parr. Uh, he was like 19 years a sommelier at a restaurant in San Francisco. He's now a winemaker. Uh, does some probably some of the best. Chardonnay Pinot Noir in California. Hold on. Uh, Cooper ba uh, Copper Bone says, this is quality entertainment educational. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Ow. <coughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rick Hayes says, Texas weather. If you don't like it, just wait a few minutes. Right. Just wait a minute. 
So, um, so Pinot Noir is very reflective of its soils, also its climate. If you put Pinot Noir, if you try doing Pinot Noir in the Central Valley, you screw it up because you lose all the nuance and characteristics. You get a one note chord song out of Pinot Noir. And it, it's just very blah. It's just very meh. Get the right soils, get the right climate, get the right, uh, <laughs> uh, you get the right soils, you get the right climate. Down at Pass, how you doing, man? Uh, with Pinot Noir, and it's majestic. Yeah, the nuances and the variances in the flavor, it's absolutely just very haunting. It's just unbelievable, freaking believable. It's very finicky. It's a thin skinned grape. It's very difficult to grow, but and it, it does only shines its best in the best places. Uh, Trinsar Evoli says, watching from Berkeley. Oh, that's only about, uh, about an hour from here. How you doing? Um, let's take this back on track. Okay. So, in understanding, so Burgundy, which is very inland, is a lot cooler than, say, uh, California. And Oregon, say the Willamette Valley, Northern Oregon, is like halfway between um california and burgundy in terms of climate and weather uh, if you were to draw a map uh, a line on the map uh from uh, burgundy over to uh the willamette valley it's on the same parallel however the willamette valley in oregon has the ocean there whereas burgundy is inland that's one of the major differences and the soil differences but if you smell and taste Pinot Noir from, say, Santa Barbara, um, Santa Cruz Mountains, Russian River. I live near the Russian River. Some of my, some of my favorite Pinot Noirs are growing right here in my backyard. Um, and Burgundy, you get a sense of what that sense of place and, the, and, the, and what the weather and what the climate does. And you're going to get more ripeness out of California. You get a little bit more of a, 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 a strawberry note, but it's more like strawberry preserves. In Burgundy, you might get a little bit more less baked, fresher strawberry characteristics, but the strawberry, strawberry character still, will still be there. You get more earthy character because the soils are different. And in Oregon, you sort of get a little of both. Um, there's a sense in which it's the whiskey coming from Texas can still seem youthful without the green notes and without the powdered sugar and saccharine notes. And I don't know how else to describe it because how do I describe with words, which is can only be perceived through the nose and the palate, but it, you get this sense that, wow, this thing has really grabbed a hold of the cask and suck the light you know suck the spirit out suck the flavors right out of it it is it, it's it, there's an intensity to the flavor even at this one so even this one which is only 47 percent 47 percent take a scotch whiskey at 47 percent say a 10 year old 12 year old at 47 percent 46 you know in that ballpark and have it side by side and what you're going to find is this whiskey is a lot more intense and concentrated in flavors because it has, for lack of a better term, it has raped the cask. <laughs> you know, it, it has really gone, bam! You know, it didn't make sweet love to the cask. It really got bam, bada, bam, bada, bam, 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 wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, out of the cask, right? It wasn't a long night of lovemaking. It was a, 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 you know, an in and out burger. You know, you know what I mean? It just, poof, and you can get a sense of that intense extraction from the cask. And the, the result is, particularly if you, if you develop a power for it and a favorability for it, is uh, you can get, you can produce these cheaper. Uh, this is 35 to $39. You can have a faster turnaround in terms of time. You know, uh, I don't know what the age is on this. It doesn't specify. This says aged at least 36 months in oak. Three years. Three years. 36 months. Okay. It says right here on the back. At least 36. They don't get specifics. Um, this is uh, batch SML20-2. 
The date is 9 8 uh, 2020, September 8, 2020. A Scotch whiskey at this age, even if it's done with the same spirit and the same casks, wouldn't have it. You, one, you'd be getting those green notes and the powdered sugar notes and so forth, uh, but you wouldn't get this intensity of the extraction from the cask. Even a Scotch whiskey that has had 10, 12 years on it isn't going to have that yanking, that just intensity of extraction um, from the cask. And consequently, you're not going to get, yeah, and you're not going to get this color. You're not going to get that color on it as well. Um, typically, and this is not a sherry cask, typically when you're looking at a wine this dark that's a scotch, you're talking sherry casks, or there's actually a little bit of redness to it. You're talking wine casks, and yet this was not put in wine casks, and this was not put in sherry casks. You don't get that kind of color on a scotch unless it's sherry cask or wine cask or something to that effect. You're not getting it from new charred virgin oak or second fill American oak casks. You're not getting that kind of color on it. Oh, sorry. You know what? I screwed up. This is actually I this is actually not that. This is actually Froke. I forgot I switched bottles. Sorry. Sorry. I no, I, I blew that. But even then, but even then, I mean look look at that color. Right? So even though I I, I forgot I poured a different whiskey in, into my bottle, I mean into my glass, look at that color. And that has a red tinge to it as well. So the analogy that the, the my point still holds. You know, I forgot I poured something different in my cask. This one, never show full through. This again, this is also says same thing, same thing. I think they put this in all the bottles, you know, uh, not at least uh, 36 months. This one is French oak, um, French oak cast, highlight the delicate aromas of stone fruit. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Now, which do I prefer? Uh, straight up, I'll tell you, which do I prefer? Do I prefer a 12, 15, 18-year-old Scotch whiskey over a 36-year-old, 36-month-year-old 30, Texas whiskey that was intensely matured? Age and maturation of two different things. It's easy to confuse the two. Um, I will take a Scotch any day. You can't defeat time. You can't beat time. There's no way, you're, you know, unless you go Star Trek <laughs> and do some time travel or something. Um, you, the, you, the, there's no way around it. You can't artificially do what nature does. Um, so I'll take a scotch. That being said, uh, these are still absolutely fantastic whiskeys um, that have a distinctive, unique character. There's also another element to these whiskeys. It's hard to describe. It's it's not an earthiness, and it's not a funk. I heard people use earthiness and funk. There's something distinctive about Texas about it. Maybe some people like it, some people don't. It's hard to describe, but it does. It is a certain sense of place, and it's it's not a fruit note. It's not a spice note. It's probably more of an earth, either somewhere between an earth and an umami note. I, I guess uh, I don't quite have the, the, the where to put it on the flavor wheel, but there's something distinctive about Texas whiskeys that a lot of them have, and that'll have that. Uh, some people don't like that. Uh, I, I, I and it's a minor note. Um, it's not like, like a major player uh, in, in the profile. So, um, if someone's blind tasting and they have challenges trying to figure out the year. In other words, they they know when it's something's really young because they get the green and the sacra notes. They recognize that. But af after that, they have difficulty figuring out the age of it. Um, if you know where it's from, that will help you figure out the age of it. Done blind, I would know these aren't scotches because of that intensity of the extraction from the cask. You don't get that sort of intensity 
an extraction from a cask in a cooler climate. You just don't. Um, the casks from Scotland and Ireland have a more milder impact, and they're not this sort of pulling on the cask. When smelling and tasting these, I get that pull from the cask. I get that sense of pulling from the cask. If I'm smelling and tasting them and I get that intensely pull from a cask sensation, then I know it's not old world. It's not Scotland. It's not Ireland. I'm going, it's got to go new, uh, old, a uh, new world. I got to go Texas. And it, particularly if it's a malt. So this has both of these, they're, 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 they maintain the malty character. The malty character is there, which you know, so you know it's, it's a malt. It's not um, a grain whiskey. It's not a, you know, a corn or anything, or anything else. Um, then I know it's not Scotland or Ireland, which means some malt from somewhere else. And with that sort of intensity extraction on the cask, you got to go Texas. I'm going to go India. Um, I'll go South, uh, South, uh, Africa, or I'm going to go Australia. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, South Africans. I have very little experience with Australians. Um, but even with the, or, 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 or Taiwan, right? Uh, like the Cavalons. You have that as well. Then it's more about, so, so you're able to figure out the climate, that this is not a Scottish climate. This is an old world climate of Scotland and Ireland. You know, it's more new world, more intense climate. Then it's really about understanding um, what is typical from that particular region. This is similar to uh, understanding um, the sense of place in the way in which the sun has an impact on grapes, the differences that has an impact on grapes in the Russian River, California, in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, uh, or Burgundy, or in New Zealand. New Zealand and California are very, very similar in terms of Pinot Noirs. Um, in Texity, yeah, PK, in Texity. Uh, uh, sage, sagebrush, Brandon Knight, sagebrush. You could be right. That it particularly... Uh, particularly, I would say more of the Garrison Brothers, that sagebrush character. I would say that's more on the Garrison Brothers than some of these other ones. But yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's probably, it's probably closer than anything I came up with. You're right. You're right. Um, and because I'm, so, so that is what would help me figure what is. Okay, now, if I know it's from a more intense climate, then I know it can't it couldn't have been aged that long because it would be over oaked. It would go over the top. All right. If you ever have a 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle, they're way, way too freaking oaky for my taste. Um, so then so if I was doing this this blind, this blind, I'd go, okay, I get the malt character, I get there's this sort of that distinctive multi character. I get this very intense extraction from the cast that's just like Kapow. Um, and so that gets me out of old world, which then takes me into new world. There is that sage brush or a particular earthy terroir characteristic that, that is of Texas, which then tells me this is from Texas. So if I was blind tasting, what I would want to do now um, is, and preparing for exams, I would now would want to take other similar client climate places or that have similar sort of uh, intense impact and do side by sides with um, Amroot uh, or uh, Paul John uh, from our uh, Lark from Tasmania or Cavalon and start doing side by side, doing side by side with these uh, to see the uh, similarities and differences uh, to get a more better sense of place. And, and that would be my approach and understanding uh, the whiskeys. I've not reviewed any Cavalons. I probably should. I've tasted a number of them. I just haven't done reviews. I haven't bought any bottles of them. I probably need to get, become more familiar with them. I have a number of different um, Amroots. I only have a couple of Larks, and that because they're given to me, they're hard to come by here. Um, but typically, if you're going to be tested on an exam, they got to test you on what's available, not something obs obscure from someplace you, you can't ever get a whiskey from. Like, try getting a whiskey from New Zealand. You know, I have one. Um, they're really hard to come by. 
Alrighty, so I've been at this for wow, an hour and wow, an hour and twenty minutes. I was actually concerned that I wouldn't be able to come up with, with a lot of content um, for tonight and talk about tonight, but um, obviously able to go for an hour and twenty minutes uh, and talking pretty quickly. Um, so I think that's about what I got for tonight. Uh, for for tonight, I'm really looking forward to getting more into these whiskeys, uh, and I think in terms of exploration, I need to explore more similar climate whiskeys, more Indian whiskeys. But my current study path is really gearing towards more towards scotch. So after after I do this Texas whiskey series for about two years, I need to just focus on scotch. I need to I really need to focus on scotch and become more uh, familiar with um, the bottlings of uh, particular distillery, some of that I haven't uh, studied yet. So uh, yes, yeah, yeah, Starward. Yeah, I have a Starward as well. Starward, though, because they tend to focus on wine casks. You get the sort of obvious um, Australian wine characteristic to it. Um, so I have one of those as well. I don't think I've ever reviewed it, but I've got one. I've tasted it. And they're very much whiny. They're very whiny. So, all right. I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, if you're watching on the replay, if you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up. Uh, if you have any comments, any questions, leave them down below. And I, I am getting a bottle of the... Hard bag fur mutation, picking it up tomorrow. Uh, so within the next couple of weeks, I should be doing a, a review of that. Uh, it'll be interesting. Um, it, I'm kind of over the hype of these yearly <coughs> excuse me, these bottlings. Just it just gets to be ridiculous, and the price cost, you know, the price quality ratio isn't there. It just gets a lot of hype. I'm kind of over it, but I got an opportunity to get one, so I'm getting one. So, alrighty, you all have a good night and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend, and uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.